All right. Hey, everyone. Here we get to the real content of the day. Um, this will be a quick presentation, uh, 50 minutes. I, uh, I wrote a, a blog post. Um, oh, actually, I have a mic. I don't know why I'm holding this one. All right. I, uh, can anyone hear me OK? Yeah, perfect. So I wrote, a, uh, I wrote a blog post last week about infinite games, and it sort of reflects a lot of my thinking over the last year. I think we, um, we had a beautiful event where I know quite a few of you here today were, were attending last year in, uh, in Amsterdam. And it was sort of the, the initial place where we got to meet everyone who's building in, uh, in the space. I think at the time, there was very few other sort of companies, aside from Flashbots, that were really building infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and it was mostly a place where we saw a lot of, uh, a lot of searchers come together and discuss some of the, the ideas and, and, uh, and trading strategies or, or insights about the space. It feels absolutely mind-blowing how far the space has come from a year ago to, uh, to today. I sort of mentioned it earlier uh, in, in the day, but you know, we had uh, we had a huge amount. We had thousands of applications for, uh, for the event today, and we had to handpick uh, from these, and we made sure that basically every single person in this room is touching uh, MEV in their day-to-day -day job in, in some way. So uh, I think it's really exciting to have seen such an industry flourish. Um, it's something that, that, uh, that I was really excited to, to be able to help put together. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how my thinking has evolved uh, since, uh, since then. So uh, a bit of a year of, of learnings. Um, so this is a, a graphic that I had put together last year that end to be uh, a bit of a prediction of how the space would evolve. Um, you know, I think it introduced and hit on a few new ideas. Uh, one of them was the builder role, which didn't exist at the time when, uh, when this was produced. Another one is you know, the idea of, uh, of intents. Um, and that's been sort of something that's blown up in the past few months in terms of, uh, of, uh, of attention. I want to, um, because the exciting thing and the exciting prediction that I had was that we'd have a diversity of, of different approaches to, to implementing these things. I want to have a bit of a, of a show of hands uh, in terms of the crowd that we have today. Which part of this stack would you say that you are, uh, you're sort of working on? So maybe we'll just start at the very beginning of it with the intent layer. Um, show of hands, who in the room is sort of working on the intent layer and, uh, and the sort of expression of user preferences? All right. So we have a handful, five, six people. Um, who is at the wallet application layer and actually building sort of interfaces for users to help them interact with the chain? For, don't be high. Put your hands up. OK. Wow, we actually only have a couple application layer people in the room right now. Um, who is working at the searcher level, uh, actually doing uh, searching, market making, any of these games? All right, we've got quite a few, actually. Where were you guys when I was asking for people to come on the searcher panel? No one messaged me. What happened? <laughs> um, all right, who's doing block building? You want to put your hand up. We have quite a few block builders in the room right now. Nice. Um, and then finally, who's at the validator layer uh, actually helping provide custody and services? Perfect. Who's at the protocol design for base layer? Beautiful. All right, cool. So we still have a good range of the, the supply chain that's, that's represented today. The framing that I had put on this on my, on my previous talk was the idea of, sort of this dichotomy between utopia and, and dystopia and the direction in which uh, monetary flows would would go in this, uh, in this supply chain. Um, I think this ended up being the wrong framing. I think in as much as we did spark a lot of innovation over the course of the last year and new teams that entered the space, I think a lot of the conversation didn't go in the direction that, um, that I wish it did. Um, it was a lot more focused on how do we sort of distribute the value that's created, who gets to capture the amount of value, are users getting you know, a good deal or a bad deal, uh, are validators getting a good deal or a bad deal, rather than I think the more important question, which is, are the systems that we're building actually useful for the world? Are they things that are improving upon the status quo? Are they things that are going to actually be able to um, drive meaningful 
uh, uh, value to the, the crypto ecosystem as a whole and deliver on this promise that we had, uh, you know, that we have as a space to, to do things better, to build better mechanisms. Um, and I don't think that that's been really the emphasis that the MEV space and the MEV infrastructure has, has had to date. Uh, and so part of the event today is to get everyone in the room together, have discussions about what they're building, and realize that really, instead of looking more like a supply chain, what we're building is a lot more complex. It's a lot more convoluted. There's a lot more back relationships between all the different items. Uh, and this is a great thing. Um, what this really is, is it shows that you can have a diversity of different experiments and different uh, mechanisms that compose with each other uh, and compete with each other in, in the creation of, uh, of, of better systems. Um, we've seen a lot of these just emerge in the last year, and so I have no doubt that uh, a year from now, this diagram will be outdated and a lot more complex. Uh, but I do think that this represents much better what we're actually trying to achieve here, which is not just a single way of getting transactions included on chain, but rather a way to fulfill um, different needs that different counterparties have and specialize in the production of those, uh, of those or in, the, in the servicing of those needs. I think framing the, um, the transaction supply network as being an optimization not just of who gets the value, is it users, is it validators, is it middlemen in the middle, but rather framing it as how does the e entire ecosystem as a whole become useful in a way that maximizes the value across all of it should really be the optimization function that, uh, that we aim for. Um, and so what does this actually end up looking like? I think it ends up looking like we have a bunch of different teams that are building different games that are composing with each other in a way that aims to provide more value. And they're competing with each other, the games are competing with each other for uh, for players and for users to submit either transaction flow, uh, liquidity, uh, information, preferences into their system. Whichever is the game that's able to better service those preferences is likely the game that's going to win. It's also likely the game that's able to generate the most value for, uh, for the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and so I really want us to think about, okay, how do we um, optimize the entire system and the value the entire system creates as, as an ecosystem rather than um, linearly, who gets to capture the bigger slice of the pile? In thinking about, okay, what, what do these games look like and how do they compose with each other, I think one simple abstraction that we, we can bring to mind is the fact that all of these structured games are composed of two very simple things. Um, they're interfaces, they're standard interfaces for messages um, that are being communicated between different parties and they're an optimization function that these parties are competing against each other on to find sort of an optimal solution. So whether we're talking about an order flow auction, whether we're talking about sort of a protocol layer uh, a system like MevBoost or, or like an intent system, they're all sort of instantiation of a similar game that are, in, uh, that are being played between these, uh, these parties. Um, one of the things that I've come to realize is while there's some sort of similarities between a lot of these games, there's also a lot of benefit from specialization. So it's likely that the games that end up uh, being the most useful are the ones that are the more locally uh, tailored to the users that it's trying to service. The goal is not necessarily to just generate and, and deploy a single game that captures all of the, um, all of the, the benefits or, or all of the you know, preferences of the end users but rather develop games that are specifically tailored for um, the narrow use cases that, um, that a subset of users uh, want. The upside of this is, I think, twofold. One of them is you better service the user and you create more value for them. The second one is that it's actually much easier to achieve um, decentralization. Um, I think one of the sort of underbelly and, and, and uh, dark truths about the design of these, uh, these sort of games is a lot of them devolve into uh, political games. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these, these difficult topics uh, and, and difficult lessons learned, I think, from, uh, from being in a position of, of having designed some of these, uh, these games in the past. Um, I think basically all consensus games are, uh, are political game by, by definition. Um, so consensus game are, you know, in the most abstract, a collaboration of people that come to agreement on something. And the tools that they have for doing this are basically sharing information, whether that's through language or through Ethereum transactions or through protocol consensus rules. 
Um, these are informations and like bits that are being shared from one uh, party to another. And uh, those uh, that information sharing also expresses contention. These, uh, these contentions end up being resolved through mostly political games. Now, I have some, uh, some abstraction of what political games actually means here, which is uh, a game that benefits from uh, information access. Um, and information access I sort of define in, in, in two ways. Uh, one of them is, uh, is through, um, or I should say information advantages. Information advantages get expressed in two ways. One of them is through access. So if you are part of uh, a closed source of order flow and you're able to uh, benefit from that to be able to have some preferred access to doing an arbitrage opportunity or you have some preferred access to uh, a validator set that others aren't able to access um, and you're therefore able to sort of win the political contentious game of who gets to define the next state update. Um, access is, is one of them and it's a, it's a trust game. It's an elitist game that, that is all about uh, uh, sort of connections and relationship. The second one is speed. So not only the access to information matters, but the speed at which you get it. Um, whether it, you are just you know, five milliseconds before someone else on the access to an arbitrage opportunity, or in a more slow political game, sort of can see way ahead of time, you know, what are the next protocol changes that are going to happen on Ethereum, and be able to start investing in your business to be able to be ready for those protocol changes. Um, the latency at which uh, information gets propagated does define the winners and losers in political games. Um, and that huge, uh, that is sort of a, a cause of, of, uh, of centralization at the end of the day. Um, and so I do want to emphasize that these games happen at many different scales, right? Both time scales and, uh, and sort of information size scales. So every single block, every single transaction in a block is a game that's being played, whether it's an auction or something else but then also every single changes that gets introduced to Ethereum as a protocol or a new company that sort of spins up and creates a game um, are also changes to, uh, to the game. And the, the information access doesn't stop at the transaction level. The information access and the, the advantages that certain parties have exist at these much more meta layers. I think one of the lessons that, that I've also learned is the idea that um, the more global a game is, the more uh, political it will be and the more centralized it will end up. Um, the more information and the more contention that you have in a game, the more you're trying to represent the state of the world within a single abstraction, with a single price discovery layer, the more uh, competition that you'll have for being able to, to win that game and the more people are going to be willing to invest in uh, developing those advantages. Um, so this is sort of a, a blessing and a curse. Right? Ethereum as a protocol has amassed a huge amount of value and it's sort of the, the home of DeFi, but also by proxy is sort of the, the biggest place where all the players are sort of competing on latency and being able to, to, uh, to control parts of, uh, of, uh, of the stack. If we're able to fragment these games into smaller games, um, we're able to sort of isolate uh, the amount of, of centralization pressure and, uh, and political pressure that there is on, um, on those systems and ultimately create redundancy in a place where there otherwise uh, would not naturally be uh, redundancy. So instead of thinking big, maybe the solution is actually to think smaller and try to think about, okay, what are the more niche, uh, niche games that we can design that are not great for everyone, um, but uh, are protected from, uh, from uh, being influenced by, uh, by the outside world. I think as a part of this is also the question of, of monolithic and uh, non-monolithic game design. Um, this is not necessarily something or like language or terminology that's, that's uh, being used a lot these days. Um, but if you have a monolithic system, to me that means a system that benefits from network effects, typically through the form of price discovery. Um, so if you have a system that aggregates a bunch of different orders and benefits from the fact that you have to go and trade on this venue or you have to send your, your transactions to this venue to be able to benefit from the best price discovery, you're encouraging and sort of developing a more monolithic system that makes it harder for external parties to spin up and, uh, and, and sort of transfer over their, um, their, their usage to, to a different system. Um, the bootstrapping cost in developing a new game increases the more that uh, these systems are this, uh, designed in a monolithic way relative to non-monolithic system design in which it really doesn't matter 
where, uh, where you send the flow. So maybe like one example here is a non-monolithic system design would be something like, um, like MevBoost, right? So MevBoost or PBS as a system, the price discovery doesn't happen at the block builder level. It happens at the, at the validator level, which means that although it's like non-trivial for a new block builder to get set up and get going and aggregate the flow, it's still trivial for them to actually start participating in the, the MevBoost uh, system and submit uh, openly to, uh, to new validators, just like it's sort of um, uh, open for any new, a new relay to come in and, and plug into the system or a new, new validator to, to come and plug into the, the MevBoost uh, architecture. There is then sort of this shared global state of price discovery that, uh, that you need to, to tap into to be able to, uh, to participate in the game. Um, and so part of what I want to encourage is also the development of more of these non-monolithic uh, system design. And when we're evaluating the games that we decide to play, um, it's a lens through which we should um, consider what are, what are positive some games and what are, are negative some games. I'm going to end up with talking a little bit about Frontier and, uh, and, and you know, the reason why we put this event together, the reason why uh, I decided to start a new company in this space and, and continue working here. Um, I think the reason why I joined this space, the reason why I got excited about crypto as a whole when I, when I started back in 2017 was the design of, of games. It was creating games that create more value for, um, for the end users that, that we're developing for. Um, and the goal for, for us is to help um, you know, the vast majority of the people here who are either designing or playing these games uh, think about the design that they're making. Um, and so on the Frontier Research side, we publish articles and mental models I'm sure quite a few of you in this room have, have read um, that I think are useful for, uh, for being custodians and, and designers of these games. And we also take advisory engagements with a lot of the teams here and work with them on how to think about you know, are these games good? Are these games useful? Are these games going to get adoption? How do we build a business around these uh, kind of game design? Um, and uh, I'm super excited to, to be able to continue doing that. Um, at the same time, we're also developing a uh, adventures uh, portfolio, which is sort of a, a set of, of efforts and, and incubated projects that uh, aim to support various different teams in the, the transaction um, supply network. Um, and so the, the initial project that we, we were bootstrapping is called the, the Faith Builder, or the F1B Builder. And it's, uh, it's a generalized uh, sort of solver that aims to plug into all these different games and help them uh, get bootstrap and, and, and provide better experiences. Um, so right now, we're, uh, we're participating in a block building game. Um, and, uh, and it's been sort of fascinating to be able to, to meet people and, and get to understand the, uh, the, the side of the player uh, in, uh, in the games that, that are being uh, designed here. Uh, and so a lot of, of really interesting lessons that we'd be, it would be keen to share with, uh, with uh, anyone who's interested in, in learning about it. Um, so that's, that's it for me. That's all I want to, I have to share for, for today. Uh, I'm really excited for everyone here to, to get to chat with each other and, uh, and foster in the next year of, uh, of MEV. Thank you.